Hey everyone, I'm Tyler. And this is my younger brother, Alex. And together, we're the Water Brothers. We're gonna take you on an adventure around the world to explore the state of our blue planet, a planet defined by water and its ability to sustain life. So join us on our journey as we explore the world, looking at the most important water stories of our time. And together, we will learn how to better protect our most precious resource. On this episode of The Water Brothers, Tyler and I are heading to Southeast Asia to take a journey down the Mekong River, the world's most productive river system. No other river feeds more people with fish than the Mekong and only the Amazon rivals the Mekong in terms of biodiversity. But not even the Amazon can compare to the sheer numbers of fish pulled from these waters. However, an environmental and social disaster looms on the horizon if a plan goes ahead to construct 11 massive hydroelectric dams on the river's lower mainstream stem. The dams will bring much needed electricity and money to the region, but could devastate fisheries and rice harvests that feed hundreds of millions of people. Over the course of a year and two separate trips during the wet and dry seasons, we set out to discover what makes this river so unique and why it is so vulnerable. Our journeys would put us face to face with the largest freshwater fish on the planet, take us walking among ancient civilizations and paddling through entire towns that float on water. So who will decide if the dam should be built? And what does the future hold for the Valley of the Damned? The Mekong River is the beating heart of Southeast Asia. And we've come here to see for ourselves what makes it so incredible. Well, I know how much you love fish, Al, so I'm not surprised we ended up here. Because the Mekong is home to over a thousand different species of fish that are the main source of food for tens of millions of people. And it's not just the number of fish. This river is home to the biggest freshwater fish in the world. Yeah, it's an amazing place for freshwater wildlife. But we've also come here at the most important time in this river's history, because the countries of the lower Mekong are about to decide if they should build massive hydroelectric dams on its mainstream stem. And they seem like a good idea, because these countries really do need more electricity, and they want to produce it themselves. But how will these dams affect the river? Well, dams are controversial no matter where they're built and here on the Mekong is no exception. What we do know is that the fate of this river and the millions of people who depend on it are all at stake. And there could not be a more interesting time to take a journey down the mighty Mekong. Originating in the Tibetan Plateau, the upper half of the nearly 5,000 kilometer long Mekong River twists and turns through the mountains of Yunnan province in southern China. But it is the southern half of the river that spills across Myanmar, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam that makes this river so unique and impressive. And if there's one defining characteristic of this river, it is fish. There are about uh, 1,100 fish species in this river. It's also a very, very uh, special because not only of the, the number of the species, but also the abundance of the, of the fish. The river supports the largest inland fishery in the world. It can contribute up to 25% of the whole world's freshwater fisheries. And that's huge. That's supporting about 60 to 70 million people. To understand just how important freshwater fish are to the people of Southeast Asia, all you have to do is visit any market in the region where hundreds of different species of Mekong fish are bought, sold, and traded every single day. The Mekong River is the lifeblood for people in the region. It's key to people's livelihoods. So the Mekong River is producing around 3 billion US dollars in fisheries per year. And that's just the value of catching the fish. And then once you look at the other economies that revolve around the fisheries, it can go up to around 9 billion US dollars per year. We did a study uh, more than a year ago just looking at, at the fish and the giant fish. And we found out that out of the 10 largest freshwater fish in the world, the Mekong has four of them. And these fishes are uh, endemic. They only exist in this river. So one, uh, which is the icon of this river, as you may know, is the Mekong giant catfish, which can grow up to uh, 350 kilos, three meters long. In 2005, a group of Thai fishermen caught what is now regarded as the biggest freshwater fish ever recorded, 
when they hauled in a 660-pound, three-meter-long giant catfish. But even the giant catfish is rivaled in size to other Mekong giants, like the giant stingray, the giant Siamese carp, and the chow preya, or dog-eating catfish. But to understand just how impressive Mekong fish could get, we knew we had to try and catch one ourselves. Because Mekong giant catfish are endangered, it is illegal to fish for them in the wild. So in order to see a live one, we had to go to an artificial lake just outside Bangkok that is stocked with fish purchased from the Thai Fisheries Department. It's not an ideal situation, but people pay good money to say they landed one of the biggest species of fish in the world. So it helps raise money for government breeding programs restoring wild populations. All right, so we got another uh, giant catfish. What an incredible fish. One of the reasons for their decline in the wild is due to overfishing, because when they grow to 500 pounds or more, one of them could feed an entire village. But the final nail in the coffin for giant catfish will likely be these mainstream dams on the Mekong River that will block their migration routes that they need to spawn. And in this uh, lake here, they actually can't spawn, so that's why it's so important for them to have wild, free-flowing rivers to survive. So. Let's hope they don't build those dams, otherwise there may be no more Mekong giant catfish in the wild. All right, let's get them back. When we arrived in Thailand to begin our journey, the entire region was undergoing some of the worst flooding in 100 years. Bangkok was underwater, and over 1,000 people had lost their lives across Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam. But our journey down the river would begin north of the affected areas at the infamous Golden Triangle, where the borders of Myanmar, Laos, and Thailand meet. We wanted to start our journey here because it was the perfect place to meet with fishermen who work on parts of the river just south of China, where three mainstream Mekong dams have already been built in the last decade. เตือนน้ํามันจะขึ้นถ้าถ้าน้ํามันขึ้นธรรมชาติเนาะมันจะขึ้นขึ้นปานจะมาเฮาก็จะได้เนาะปานจะมาอันนี้พอน้ํามัน
This flood pulse is what allows the river to expand and, and shrink each year. Water carries a lot of nutrients, and these nutrients go out into the fields, and it allows the region to be very productive. Flood pulse is what allows for a lot of agricultural production. A lot of paddy fields are dependent on this, and the fisheries are dependent on it. If you look at the Mekong River system, you have the mainstream, and then you have the tributaries. If you think about connectivity, it's not just the length of the river, it's the connectivity between the different types of ecosystems. And these are still relatively connected compared to other large rivers in the world. If all 11 mainstream dams were built, over half of the river will turn into a slow-moving reservoir. And this reservoir is going to have drastic changes on the river's flood pulse and, and just the normal flows. In turn, it's going to impact fisheries and agricultural production. And nowhere is the effect of the flood pulse more evident than Cambodia's Tonle Sap, or Great Lake. For most of the year, the Tonle Sap is relatively small and is only about a meter deep. But in the wet season, the force of the Mekong becomes so strong that it backs up the flow of the Tonle Sap River and starts filling up the lake. Within a month, the lake expands by five times its original size and swells to over 16,000 square kilometers, flooding surrounding plains, forests, and even entire towns. Over the course of a year, Tyler and I made two trips to the Tonle Sap to see how homes that once towered on stilts 10 meters high in the dry season were transformed into lakefront properties. And volleyball courts and streets that were once filled with cars and bikes, we now paddled over just a few months later. There is no other lake on earth that undergoes such intense variations in water levels. And the flooded lake provides rich and diverse habitats for fish that have fed the people of this region for thousands of years. Like the ancient Angkor civilization that once flourished on the banks of the Tonle Sap. The flood pulse of the Mekong is the major force responsible for its incredible productivity. But these huge variations in water levels also mean that fish must constantly be on the move. Up to 70% of the fish catch are migratory species, which means they have to go up and down, up the river and down and feed in the flood plains. In the Columbia River, um, you can count the number of the fish that pass by the dam, and over there, Every year, there are about two million fish that pass by the dam. That sounds like a lot, right? Um, in the Mekong River, um, around the Tonle Sap area, the Great Lake, in the high season, you can have three million fish passing by every hour. So two million versus three million, and one year versus one hour. This is the, the scope, the scale of migration that we are talking about. Anything that alters the flow, the duration of the flood, this flood pulse, any way that this flood pulse is altered will have a direct impact on, 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 on fish productivity. In Cambodia, fish is the main source of diet. It's the main source of protein. It provides 80% of people's food. So if you didn't have fish, what would people eat? Some of the most common sites on the banks of the Mekong and Tonle Sap are the thousands of floating fish processing huts that drive the entire Cambodian fishery. So we're here at a Prahok fish paste factory right now. Uh, Prahok is a fish paste. It is a staple of the Cambodian diet and is used primarily with these small fish called prahin. And uh, here at this one factory alone, they go through about 25 to 30 tons of these fish each day. Um, most of the workers here work from 7 in the morning till 10 at night. And they make about $65 a month, which is a lot when you consider that teachers in Cambodia, on average, make about $30 a month. So it gives you a sense of how important this fish paste is to them. And uh, maybe they make a little bit more because of the occupational hazard of using these heavy knives. Once the heads and scales are removed, fish are then salted, dried, and fermented for several months, creating this pungent paste that is rich in protein and used to flavor every Cambodian dish. To get a better idea of why dams in the region are unable to manage the river's intense flood pulse, we traveled to the Saison River, one of the Mekong's largest tributaries. We came here to speak with locals in Cambodia who have been affected by a Vietnamese dam built just over the border. On September 29, 2009, following an intense typhoon rainstorm, 
the Yali Falls Dam was forced to suddenly release water from its overflowing reservoir, creating a devastating flood surge five meters high. Downstream villages in Cambodia were never informed when the floodgates were opened, and over 40 people were swept away in the chaos that followed. <laughs> The flooding event was tragic, but the long-term effects on the river from the dam have also been devastating. Fish populations have plummeted, and even the quality of the water has degraded, as the reservoir behind the dam has converted a huge portion of this once fast-moving river into a stagnant lake that is now a breeding ground for harmful bacteria. Of the 11 dams planned, the Zyberi Dam in northern Laos is the first one set to be built. And it is the four countries of Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam and Laos that make up the Mekong River Commission and will ultimately decide if any more mainstream dams will be built. The Mekong River is facing a critical time. If the four governments choose to build the Zayaberi Dam, we know that there's going to be devastating impacts. If built, this dam is going to block fish migration from between 23 to 100 migratory fish species. At the same time, it's going to cause the extinction of around 41 fish species including the Mekong giant catfish. This dam is going to have devastating impacts on people's culture, on livelihoods, and on food. Um, so by building any of these mainstream dams, we see that uh, basically a period of bloom will come over the Mekong region. But the dams will block much more than just fish migrations. The construction of any mainstream dams on the lower Mekong will also reduce the amount of sediment that reaches the fertile delta in southern Vietnam. So the delta is sinking on its own weight every year, and that's a natural process. But every year, it also receives a lot of sand being carried down the river uh, when it's still free-flowing, um, and that builds it up. Once the sand is lost, um, the delta would be sinking. On the other hand, you know, now we are talking about climate change and sea level, sea level rise, and that would mean you have more water coming in from the sea and less sand to build it up. The Mekong Delta didn't exist 6,000 years ago, and it has come into being thanks to the sediment brought out by the Mekong River. It is now one of the most fertile areas in the world. The Mekong Delta is the basket of food for the country. It is producing more than half of the country's food, more than half of the country's fishery production, and more than half of the fruit production of the country. Vietnam is the second biggest rice exporter in the world, with 95% of the rice export coming from the Delta. So in terms of food security, the Mekong Delta is not only important to the country, but also to the region and the world. It is no secret that Laos wants to build more dams so it can start selling electricity to its neighbors and help the country climb out of poverty. So we went to talk with the director of the Laos Department of Electricity to hear what he thought about the consequences of building mainstream dams like Zyaburi. We are convinced that the, uh, the, uh, the, the construction of the dam with the provision of the fish ladders, which is fairly uh, complex and I mean, high technology things, and it costs a lot of money. Will, will solve the problem. I mean, it will, will minimize the impacts on the fish migration. There's no, there's no example in the world of very successful 
uh, fish passage for them in, in this kind of tropical rivers. Like I said, if the fish cannot go, we have the fish uh, breeding stations that can help to restock the upstream and downstream connected. I mean, they have done it all over the world. So the, maybe the, the solution for you is, is just saying, just keep culturing the fish and breeding them, and yep. the wild fish are sort of left to fend for themselves. Fish ladders are elevated steps that allow fish to swim around dams. However, you don't have to look very hard to find examples of how ineffective they are. Perhaps the most infamous example being the heavily dammed Columbia River that flows through Western Canada and the United States. We're talking about five or six, spawn, uh, five or six species of West Coast Pacific salmon. And, in, and it's in a mass of billions of dollars trying to, trying to maintain that stock and they fail. It, you know, fish ladders or rafting or elevators or any of those kind of things uh, have not even been, and that's five species of jumping species of fish, okay? Fish that are used to jumping, to getting up over ladders and up over obstacles, and we still can't, you still can't do that. I mean, it's unrealistic to think that there's any sort of engineering type mitigation that will be able to allow these fish, you know, pass a, a full mainstream uh, down. Is conventional hydropower, it's a renewable energy source, but it, does it still create carbon emissions? I don't think so. On hydropower, large, small, medium, with reservoir or with small reservoir or with power reservoir runoff, all of them are renewable. This is most of the countries now have adopted this uh, understanding. Hydropower is not a clean energy. It's a myth to believe it is. Hydropower produces a lot of greenhouse gases um, which contribute to climate change. So you have a reservoir behind the dam and there there's rotting vegetation. So this biomass is, is fueling the methane production. So some dams are as bad as coal fire plants in the region. Laos does not want to be receiving grant and assistance, you know, five million dollars this year, ten million dollars next year. It's, it's, it's nothing. You can never get your country out of poverty. And the minister makes a very important point, that the Zyberi Dam could certainly help get his country out of poverty. However, while this dam will generate billions of dollars in revenue, there is a complete lack of research that has been conducted on this part of the river to determine if these financial gains will be able to offset the losses in fisheries and agricultural production that are also valued in the billions of dollars. There's just one issue I want to mention briefly before concluding, and that is the very serious question of new dams on the main Mekong stem. This is a serious issue for all the countries that share the Mekong River, because if any country builds a dam, <clears throat> all countries will feel the consequences in terms of environmental degradation, challenges to food security, and impacts on communities. I want to urge all parties to pause on any considerations to build new dams until we are all able to do a better assessment of the likely consequences. Because the Mekong experiences such drastic changes in water levels between the wet and the dry seasons, it would be extremely difficult to manage a cascade of large dams that would all be fighting to share the same supply of water to fill their reservoirs and maintain maximum electricity generation. And as climate change intensifies the severity of droughts and monsoons and melts away the river's glacial source waters in the Himalayas, it is unreasonable to assume that such a massive network of dams will be able to manage this complex flood cycle that will only become more unpredictable in the future. Dams are essentially a dinosaur technology. Um, in the United States in the 1950s, we built dams a lot, and now we decommission dams. Uh, we realize that they are bad for the environment and that there's many better ways to produce electricity. Zyberi Dam is setting precedent in the way the four countries are looking at scientific research and deciding whether or not mainstream dams should be built. And it's looking at whether politics over, overrules science. Um, if the Zyberi Dam is built, it's likely to set in series a domino effect, and so all the make on mainstream dams are likely to be built. Many experts agree that if there could be a delay of at least 10 years in the construction of any mainstream dams, it would allow more time for scientists to conduct detailed studies on how these dams could be designed to minimize their impacts. And more importantly, it would give these countries more time to consider alternative methods of electricity generation. 
Technologies like solar and biogas generation are much better alternatives to bring electricity to the rural communities along the Mekong that are not even connected to any national power grids and who would also suffer the most from dam developments. But the most important lesson we learned is that no matter where we live in this world, we must be very careful about how we balance our needs for more energy and electricity with the ability of our local ecosystems to provide us with food and clean water. So we've come to the end of our journey here in Vietnam, where the Mekong River flows out into the South China Sea. And it was amazing to see all the biodiversity this river has to offer, and just how many people can rely on one river system. Yeah, there's really no other river like it on Earth. But after taking this trip, it made us feel a lot of concern for the millions of people who need a clean and free-flowing Mekong River to survive. And this is a difficult time for these countries because they really do need electricity to help encourage economic growth. But at the same time, a big percentage of the population still rely on fishing and farming practices that would be put at risk to satisfy these energy needs. And there's no easy solution to these problems either. But we still can't figure out why mainstream dams would be a good idea. We learned how dams in tropical regions can actually produce greenhouse gas emissions and how they can block critical sediment movements and fish migrations. Sure, the dams are going to produce a lot of electricity, but you can't eat electricity. And one of the big concerns we have is that we don't know how long these dams will actually last and whether or not they'll be able to stand up to the effects of climate change. But if there's any good news to share, it's that the dams haven't been built yet. And Laos has received a great deal of international pressure to rethink their hydropower aspirations. There's still time to find that correct balance between development and conservation, and to find alternative ways to bring renewable energy to Southeast Asia. <laughs> ขอหัวใจของเรามีแม่น้ำ